appreciate uh, everyone's presence here today. <clears throat> uh, I'm a fill-in. When uh, BJ contacted me uh, some, well, I guess it'd be over a year ago now, uh, the speaker couldn't, uh, couldn't make it or couldn't uh, fill the, the time slot, and so uh, he contacted me. I've always been curious of who that speaker was supposed to have been. But at any rate, uh, magnifying uh, him uh, in our golden years. I would like to uh, look at a passage that uh, Brother uh, Winkler dealt with the other night, and he did a great job. But I think it, it highlights what uh, we need to be focusing upon it ourselves. In Philippians 1, verses 19 and 20, <clears throat> notice these words. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that which is all boldness as always, so now also Christ may be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. The fact that uh, this is our whole purpose, it's not uh, where we're going to live, it's not what house we're going to build, it's not all of the other material things in life. Our focus, our main time vocation is magnifying Christ. And uh, we're to do this, and if we start, as we'll mention a little later, if we will start that when we're in our youth, and as we grow and as we build upon that, then when we reach our, our twilight years, our retirement years, our, our years where we're not able to do what we once did, uh, we don't have to give even a second thought as to why we're doing it. It's been just an integral part of us. How many of you, when you get up in the morning, do you leave a note saying, I need to put on my socks and then my shoes no, we've done that for so many years. We've built that habit. We know and we understand, and that's what uh, preaching and that's what magnifying Christ is really all about. I find it interesting, and, and uh, there's so much that could be said. I looked in the, the manuscript. Uh, we dealt with just magnifying Christ and how you will find that in all three uh, dispensations of time were those that uh, were magnifying Christ. That was their main purpose. So it's found all throughout. But I want to look at this in a threefold uh, purpose. You know, when you go to school, they teach you that every good sermon should have three points. And if you're fortunate enough to have a poem to go along with it, that's just the icing on the cake. Well, I don't have a poem, but I do have three points. And that's what we're going to be looking at. First of all, what is this of magnifying him? And then we're going to uh, be identifying that as we look at it in a more pointed uh, position, and then we'll look at the, uh, the, the actual action of it, and then we'll look at it in our twilight years. When we understand this idea of magnification, uh, I think the Apostle Paul, as we read the verse in Philippians 1, was epitomizing the fact that he had a very unique perspective upon life and upon preaching, upon what his role really was. And uh, in his mission, his ardent desire was to reflect the furtherance of the gospel. That's what Paul was all about. Everywhere he went, everyone he met, it was how can I teach them the gospel of Christ? Of course, the, the obvious um, desire would be that they would obey and would become a Christian and would be added to the kingdom of God. But uh, Paul couldn't force that. He couldn't make that, nor can we. We understand that we have to do the very best that we can, make sure our motives are right, they're clean, they're pure, and we're not doing it for a selfish means. But whatever the avenue is, whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching, and you know, it's been so many ways that we can do that. Uh, Tom mentioned the uh, uh, media, the outlet that we use. 
uh, at the time that we went on, which is a little over three years ago now, uh, there wasn't much being done uh, in you, on YouTube and the, uh, Facebook, and so we created a, a Bible study and uh, gave it where people could uh, write in a question. We could see the response that would come. Um, so social media has been a uh, tool that the devil has used for a long enough time. I think it's about time that we started using it, using it in a good way. Um, but the, the efforts and the means, it has to be right. It has to be pure. And that's what, what Paul was really urging and thinking about. He was defending the gospel of Christ. And uh, he understood what God expected of him. This was uh, very uh, clear, that everyone else was subordinate. In other words, he knew that he was to keep the main thing. Now watch this. This is so profound. The main thing. Being focused upon the gospel and what it was. And, and so the action of this very idea uh, carries with it the idea of to extol, it means to glorify, to honor, or praise. And uh, according to Vine and his um, excellent work, uh, he gives us the Greek word, megaluno, and uh, it says to make great. And we think about that, and there's so many ways in which we can fulfill that uh, in our, our mission. Strong uh, made mention to, uh, to make or declare uh, excellent or great. So here's the whole purpose, friends. To magnify Christ means that he would be enlarged, more highly esteemed by others. Now, there's ways that we can accomplish that. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, how do we magnify Christ? In, in our lives. Now, we're not all there in the twilight years. So I guess those begin when you retire, if you retire. We moved to uh, Alabama. Our daughter lived there, and she said, uh, uh, had a number of uh, health issues. And she says, Dad, it'd be better if you all could move down here and be with us while you have your health than we'd have to wait and, and do that later. And so uh, an opportunity came open at Faulkner University. My wife applied for it, and uh, she got that. And uh, so she directed the uh, Mobile campus of Faulkner University, and uh, we were able to settle in that area. We attend the uh, serv uh, church uh, services where uh, VP Black was for a long number of years. It used to be the old Plateau congregation, they moved out of that area and up into Sarah Land, and now it's the Central Church of Christ. Uh, some of you may know Brother Wes Garland, a graduate of the Tri-City School of Preaching uh, a few years ago, and he's now working with us and doing a great work. But uh, with that, uh, how do we, how do I, how do you magnify Christ in what it is that you can do? You may have ailments. You may be limited. Uh, in some way, I guess we're all limited, but uh, how, how do we magnify Christ? How do we accomplish that? I think that's very, very important. Uh, how do we enlarge him? Now, now, not the idea that we make Christ bigger than what he really is. You know, we can't do that, okay? But how can we highlight aspects about him so that he is seen as he really is in the lives of others. That's what Paul was concerned with. That's what I'm concerned with. And so there are a number of uh, things that we talked about with that. But I want to mention something here. Uh, and I didn't realize this for a long period of time. But you know, magnific uh, magnification uh, can be a little bit misleading. You know, we think about the... Uh, uh, the Hubble telescope, and we think about, you know, the humongous size and the location of that, and how we can look way out there in the immense space and all the things that we can see. Well, that's really not the idea. That's really not the connotation here. 
uh, it's not so much its ability to magnify, but listen to this, to make something look bigger as it is its ability to collect more light and thus to improve that which one is looking upon. So as we have Christ focused out here in our life, as we are seeking to live and to honor however we can accomplish that, is it a lifelike figure? Is it clearly seen by others? That's really the idea here. And, and that brings us right into the, the uh, uh, action of what magnify really means. And uh, looking at this, we think about the microscope and the telescope. These are the two ways we have of magnifying things. And so what happens? The microscope makes a small thing look big, look much larger than it re what it what really is. The telescope, however, it uh, makes a big thing begin to look as big as it really is. You look out there, and they say that uh, the average eye can see about seven miles, see things in a distance about seven miles. Uh, when the uh, space uh, ship used to go up from uh, uh, Florida, uh, you know, we lived in Florida a number of years, and uh, you could watch that. Uh, we watched it even the year that uh, it exploded and, and come apart. And, and we knew something had it literally happened, but, but you could see that just kind of fade into uh, the sky as it was getting smaller and smaller. But you can see about seven, about seven miles, they tell us. So what do we have with this? Well, let me show you what David thought about it. David said, I will praise the name of God with a song and I will magnify him with thanksgiving, that's Psalm 69 and verse 30. Now, it's interesting to me what David meant by that. He did not mean that I will make a small God look bigger. That wasn't the idea. Then he is. He means that I will make a big God begin to look as big as he really is. And he's going to be clear. It's going to be sharp. It's going to be distinct. And isn't that what we're looking for? When you look at a portrait, whether it be of family, self, whoever, whoever it may be, you look for the details within that. How clear, how crisp is it? Well, that's the idea. Magnifying Christ is how clear can we make it so that people have to have help to misunderstand what is being said. Now, friends, when we can portray Christ when we can portray him and deity in that vein, we have accomplished something. Uh, what is it they say that uh, children, uh, all of the things that they are able to memorize and learn from just little children? And what is it? Christ spoke in one and two syllable words? Why do you suppose that was? I have an idea that it was because he wanted even young people to understand who he was. And it didn't take those $64,000 words to be able to show his intelligence. He wanted to be understood. And so magnifying him in this way. Now, the case is that man can alter his perception of God and make him more prominent, more important. And we do that a number of ways, by the way we live, by the way we communicate, by the way that we handle the gospel, by the way that we use things. Um, I'm quite frequently saying to our members there at Central, we talk about going to church. I said, oh, let's not use that. I don't like that idea, going to church. Let's go to worship. You know, we, we understand we're the church. And so when people can speak in a more clearer way, I think we're highlighting those things about the gospel that's going to cause people to understand. The church is going to understand Christ, understand deity. And th if we can do that, friends, we will have accomplished our mission. 
I'm not in the business to keep up of all who obey the gospel and those who don't. Those who don't, I want to continue with them until such time as it becomes fruitless. Then we dust our, the, uh, off our shoes and we move on to more fertile ground. But it's the idea, are we doing what we can? Are we making Christ this clear picture of this one? Surely nothing we can do will make God more powerful or more holy than he already is. The Bible has taken care of that for us. But we can and we must acknowledge his greatness and make others aware of that greatness as well. Uh, there's some other things that we go into the uh, uh, book with that is more detailed, but uh, I want to uh, forego some of those things. And I'd like to spend the majority of our time looking at magnifying his name in the twilight years. As I come to think about that, I, I often think that, uh, you know, there should never come a time that we throw in the towel. Now, that's an old phrase that I've heard all my life growing up. I can remember as a young lad in Michigan that on Friday nights, it would be the Friday night fights, uh, boxing matches that would come on. And sometimes some of those fighters just getting started, uh, while the, um, their manager would throw in the towel, calling the match. Let's let, end it here before uh, some real danger sets forth. And I've heard that, and I've understood what that meant. And I'm, what I'm emphasizing now is there should never come a time in your life or in my life that we throw in the towel, that we call it quits. We've done all that we can. It's time now to take our seat and let someone else take over. That's not the situation or the idea. Because when the going gets tough, what happens? The tough get going, and that's the way it ought to be. I think it's designed to very much to be that way. This is the commitment that we all made when we obeyed the gospel, that we were going to live our life as it is of Christ. And uh, when we obeyed that gospel, we promised what? We promised our love. We promised our obedience, our service, our worship. We promised everything about us that we were going to be committed to that very idea. So it's not a time of retirement. Not a time of retirement from the Lord. For there is no, uh, there's so much that needs to be accomplished, that can be accomplished, and I'm convinced will be accomplished if we will just forget about uh, calling things quits, saying I've had enough, I've done enough. Uh, I know that things have been different in uh, the last two years with this COVID uh, 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 pandemic as we've had it. Uh, we've not lived through anything like that. So it was something that we all had to experience. And I know that there was a lot of people. I was talking uh, to a preacher, I believe it was Paul Sane, who told me that a few months back that both he and uh, LaDonna had it. And he said it was a pretty tough three weeks uh, that they had. I know some others that have had it. We were fortunate. We didn't. We've had our shots, and uh, we still try to, you know, practice social distancing and do, you know, whatever needs to be done. But I doubt that anything that you and I are called upon to suffer here in this life can never be compared, of course, to what Christ went through. But I want to make it a little more modern than that. When we go back in the uh, latter days of the Restoration Movement, and we think about what those men had to endure, and uh, the uh, hatred that, uh, that was in existence towards the Lord's Church, uh, many times calling, calling us Campbellites, and uh, other things that were taking place. And then we look from that time frame on to the time of Brother Foy Wallace, Jr., and uh, uh, various ones, and I will say a little bit more about some of those. But we think about the days that they went through. I remember Brother Wallace telling some stories that I'll never forget. That he was out holding a meeting one time, and uh, they didn't have any, any facilities. 
And so um, he carried uh, a uh, bed with him in, in a vehicle and that he could rest on it. And um, the idea, he said, uh, make sure the bed bugs don't bite. He said at nighttime, they had to go out. They had to make sure that it was cleaned and it was set. Otherwise, he said, uh, they would. And a company, well, you and I, it, it's hard to even fathom things like that uh, as to what we, we have to go through. But let me tell you something. Men who have and who continue to serve elders, deacons, ministers, and men and women who served as Bible school teachers, writers, speakers in different programs. These are our heroes. I have those that I look up to that I have admired through the years who have been encouragers to me, who've been interested in our work. And uh, when we get together, we're praying for you. Uh, I remember when I was a student here at the Memphis School of Preaching back in the, in the 70s. I finished in 76. That was just behind you, wasn't it, Gerald? You finished in what, 73, 4? 73. And um, some of those works, Brother Robert Taylor had just moved from uh, Ripley, Mississippi to Ripley, Tennessee. And uh, he had learned of our needs, and so they, uh, he and the congregation, uh, had us up to Ripley and uh, they got to meet us and they supported us for the whole two years that we were here. And oftentimes we, uh, they would call us and they'd come up. I filled in for Robert a lot of times when he was away in meetings and in the summertime it seemed like he was never at home. And uh, we were going up there one time and visiting and it was about five minutes before service time, and one of the elders, Brother Falk, was supposed to uh, teach the class, but he had just had some eye surgery, and when he saw me come in, he pointed for me, and he said, you're teaching the class tonight. Well, uh, Brother Hearn used to teach us. He said, boys, he said, always have a sermon in your Bible. Always have something that you can talk about, that you can deal with, that you're familiar with, and he said, because you'll never know visiting congregations when there will be a need like that. And so we've been grateful for, for those. Robert Taylor has been one of the greatest supporters that I've ever had, never known. Both he and Irene were, were always uh, interested in us and wanting to know how things were going. And uh, we've been as interested in them as well. But they've showed us that it can be done that you can glorify God, you can magnify his name. You can do it in whatever capacity you have. And so uh, we just need to follow in their steps. Uh, this is precisely what is so badly needed today. Not that we're not preaching the gospel. I know that men that are going, going through the Memphis School of Preaching and other places, they are committed to preaching the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I'm thankful to God for that. But friends, what we really need is not only those that will preach the truth, but those who are living godly lives so that there can be consistency and harmony between what is being preached and proclaimed and what is being lived. You know, it's just like that old poem of Edgar A. Guess. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely show the way. It's so much clearer. And friends, that's using that telescope to make Christ clear and crisp. That's what we really need. Because that with that example, then we can not only tell people, here is the truth, but here is an example of how you can live that truth. Oh, are we thankful to God. That is so badly new, needed. That influence that must continue. Listen to just a little bit. The Apostle John was nearly 100 years old when he came off the island of Patmos back into Ephesus distance of about 15 miles, and uh, it was there that uh, John lived in his latter days. There are many accounts that tell 
that men from the church in Ephesus would get uh, one on one side and one on the other side of John and would kind of help hold him up and encourage him to speak words of encouragement to the congregation there. I can just see when I read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John some of those very things that he said. My little children love one another because you know what? I believe it was one of the speakers yesterday that says, you know what love really means? Spelled out time. Time. Spending time with people. Showing them these things. Oh, uh, what John did in that great letter that we know as the book of Revelation that he wrote there. But the latter part of his life, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, these were all books that were written uh, in about 80 to 95 A.D. at the very close of John's life. Now, whether that would be considered his twilight years or not, I'm not sure. But I know this. He was faithful to the very end, using his ability to do what he could do. It was told that men could literally hold up John, as we mentioned. How about Noah? God waited 600 years uh, be, uh, before Noah was called to be the preserver of the human race. And you remember all the things that he did? How that he built the ark to the saving of his soul. Uh, he and his wife, his three sons and their wives, and uh, all that was done. Uh, God made Abraham and Sarah wait until they were 190, respectively, before the birth of Isaac was allowed, and all the blessings that came about through that. Moses was not ready to deliver Israel from Egypt until the age of 80. Now, why are we mentioning these? Well, first of all, we're mentioning these because it takes time for maturity. Just a few years out in the work doesn't suffice. It's needed, it's helpful, but it's not going to accomplish all. There is maturity that is needed. Caleb was 85 years old when in Joshua 14, 13, he said, give me this mountain for my inheritance. Can you imagine that at 85 years of age? Many servants of God were at their best in their twilight years. Now I'm going to reminisce just a little bit. Men like Foy Wallace Jr. I never got to meet Brother Wallace. I went to Memphis one time when he was holding a meeting here. And um, he was in the hospital by, in the daytime. They would let him out at night long enough to preach his meeting. And then he'd go right back to the hospital. So Noel Meredith uh, pitched in that day and spoke uh, in his absence. And then he would be back that night. But men like uh, Foy Wallace Jr., in the battles that he raged, I'll tell you what, friends, we would be bombarded with the idea of the millennial mistakes if it wasn't for Foy Wallace Jr. And all of the debates and all the men that he met and how that he thoroughly defeated that idea. And we're thankful to God for those books. I have many of those I was able to purchase, but I was out in, uh, in uh, Plano, Texas one time, and just out just near uh, uh, Kingsland, Texas, and uh, one of uh, Brother Wallace's supporters, um, Ira Jean and, uh, or Howard and Ira Jean Higgins, and we stayed with them, and uh, he gave me a, a book or two that I did not have of Brother Wallace, and uh, tremendous. Think about G.K. Wallace. I remember of hearing Brother G.K. Wallace early at the Frieda Hardeman lectures. And it just sat at the edge of my seat. I couldn't believe that his time was gone. And uh, we'd have to come back the next day and he'd go away. I remember those lectures. And I remember of that little voice, sometimes a little bit squeaky. But boy, he could make his point. Oh, we're thankful to that. B.C. Good Pasture. I never appreciated Brother Goodpasture in my younger life, but I realized that later as he edited the Gospel Advocate for a long number of years, 
I heard him speak at uh, Get Well Lectures one time, and I thought something had happened, and they sure enough had uh, no notified him that it was a, he went home from that week, and he had had a mini stroke. And uh, you, you could tell that in his lectures. But let me tell you something. That man was faithful, preached the truth. He loved the church. He loved brethren. And he loved to encourage people. Friends, isn't that what he, he was magnifying Christ. He was causing each one of us to have this clear, concise idea of who Jesus Christ was. He was magnifying him. Well... How about Guyan Woods? Perhaps no man has debated more than Brother Guyan Woods did in his career. He had a great work with, at the very end with the Gospel Advocate. Heard him in a number of Gospel meetings. And Brother Guyan Woods, what a great man. You know what? His commentary on the book of John is priceless. It is priceless when you read through and understand some of those things. How about Thomas B. Warren and uh, his intellectual ability to meet the atheists and the agnostics of the day? And when he got done with them, uh, he showed the foolishness of what that position really was. We're grateful for his works. Franklin Camp, Winford Clark, Roy Hearn, Curtis Cates, Garland Elkins, and I could go on and mention many others as well. But every one of these men, in some way or another, had a tremendous influence upon my life. And I remember when I first began preaching, I looked at some of them as being in their twilight years then, and how they lived for many years beyond that, and they were faithful to God. Here's what, friends. May God grant us more men like these because of who they were. Friends, that is why in the early 1950s, the Church of Christ was known as one of the strongest and the fastest growing of all religious groups. Why? Why, they were out here making, making him so magnificent so clearly the concept and the perception that people had. Why, it was easy for them to obey the gospel. They knew what was being uh, involved, what it was all about. And so these men never thought of calling it quits. Aren't we thankful for that? Why, they were busying themselves with service. Now, whether they ever considered themselves in the twilight years or not, I don't consider myself in the twilight years, though I have reached the three score and ten. I'm not. I'm going to end it right there. <laughs> but why is this the case? Why is it men and women all through all across this land, people that we have known, why were they were able to do that? Because they believed what Jesus said in Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee a crown of life. That's faithfulness. That's what it is to magnify Christ. You can't do it if you're not faithful. Some of the greatest works can be done as one reaches the twilight years. You know, I can remember a time uh, when we had an, uh, an elder back in a congregation in Michigan where I came, when I came to the school. And he believed that uh, preachers ought to, ought to move on about every three years. He said they've preached through all their sermons. And it wasn't the idea that they had uh, grown or you know, had developed any new ones. A and believed that uh, when they reached about their 60s that their time was just about done. That they might would stay with the congregation a year or two, but they were interested in time. And I, and I was influenced by that. And it took me after I came through the Memphis School of Preaching that I began to see he had a wrong concept. But how many others were like that, that felt that very way? No, we need people who will, whatever their age, that will be faithful to God. Wisdom, wisdom teaches us that a man needs Christian maturity. 
He needs to grow before he is considered a seasoned leader, able to lead others. You look at Nehemiah. How is it that he was able to motivate? While they were defending themselves from all of the uh, ill will of Sambiat and Tobiath and Gershom, they were feeding and they were building and laying the temple. Now you think about that as a task. And yet Nehemiah 4, 6 says, So built we all the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. Why? For the people had a mind to work. Who created that in those people? Nehemiah. Oh, what a leader Nehemiah was. Wisdom teaches us that that's what you need in a leader. Wisdom more likely to be found among the hoary heads among us. The case is that there are many things that cannot be learned in just a few short years, but with time and experience, they can become uh, very much an integral part of us, and we'll see the reality of them. There is so much work that needs to be done. We have those who are well qualified and willing, so let's encourage them to keep on keeping on. Man who has served uh, preaching and teaching. When I first went to Alabama, uh, they'd approached me, and uh, they were looking for a preacher, and I said, I'm not interested. I said, my health will not allow me to do what a preacher really needs to do. And I would not be true to myself. I wouldn't be true to you or the best that was within me. Uh, but I said, I don't want to be put on a shelf. I want to be used. Use me whichever way that you think is best, but I'd like to be able to contribute something. Well, it was over uh, probably about three years, I believe it was after that, uh, they'd asked me to serve as an elder. And uh, having met with them and understood the, the nature of the work there, I became an elder and I served as an elder for about five years until uh, some other issues were coming up that just would not allow me to, to be able to do that kind of work. But uh, wisdom was that you know they they said here's a man who's preached the gospel and it had been uh, about 40 years at that time and they said uh, we can draw upon this we can use this um, and so uh, they put me right to work and i was the happiest serving god oh i knew i couldn't uh, endure the way i did at one time but i was happy that they were allowing me to do what i could do that's what i wanted to do in my heart there's so much that really needs to be done and can be. Men who can serve as elders, they've proved themselves, they're well qualified, they have a good knowledge of what's happening in the world. They know the influences that can come into a local work. And so men like that, they are invaluable. Their wives, I know I'm speaking mostly to men, but I certainly don't want to leave the wives out because uh, wives are very important as well in things that they can do. And so youth is not the golden age, friends. The, the winner of life can be most glistening and productive if we'll allow it. As one has aptly stated, true youth is faster, but age is more accurate. And I think that is exactly the case as it ought to be. Magnifying him in our golden years, whatever years those may be, no doubt referring to retirement. May you and I use our talent, our ability, whatever it may be, but may we use it to make Christ as crystal clear as we can possibly make him in this world. All praise and glory be unto him. Thank you for your good attention.